James 2, verses 14 to 26, entitled Faith and Deeds. What good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but have no deeds? Can such faith save him? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you say to him, Go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, You have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by what I do. You believe that there is one God. Good, even the demons believe that, and shuddered. You foolish man, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our ancestor Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called God's friend. You see that a person is justified by what he does, and not by faith alone. In the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did, when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them out off in a different direction. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. May the Lord add his blessings to his word. Thanks very much, Judy. So, um, James obviously puts a bit of a corrective to those people who think they can just believe God and then do nothing. I wonder if you've ever looked at the life of the Lord Jesus Christ and thought what it would look like if he didn't do anything. And if he walked along the road and he saw somebody was ill and he just went, oh, I hope you're feeling better soon. Or, you know, the 5,000 were there starving and he went, oh, Tesco's I hear have got a good deal on. Or, or not that Tesco's was around then, I do know that's not the case. Um, when you look at the life of the Lord Jesus Christ, he had this fantastically integrated life. His words and his actions went together. And he's our example, and we want to follow him, don't we? So in a way, as we read James's words, they sort of make a lot of sense. You know, walk the talk, or something along those lines. I want to introduce you to two fictitious people, okay? They are definitely fictitious. I don't want any of you to think he's talking... Well, you may think he's talking about me, but I'm not, that's not my intention. So, here we go. I want to introduce you to Henry, first of all. He calls himself a Christian. He goes to church, reads his prayers, he pays his taxes, and is generous to his wife. Interesting, that, isn't it? But you see, he's wrong. He's not a Christian, since all he's done, all I've told you about him, is he's made a catalogue of good deeds. Henry needs to hear Paul's teaching, which says that all of our good deeds of themselves are as filthy rags before a holy God. Even the best things that we do fall short of perfection and pure holiness. If Henry were to go up to heaven and perhaps meet Peter and... Uh, and Peter says, so, okay, well, why, why should you come in, Henry? And he starts giving his catalogue of all the good things he's done. Henry says, I'm really sorry. Didn't you hear about my son? Did, did, you, did you think he came and died on the cross to make you slightly better? He came and died on the cross because all of your good deeds, even them, were filthy rags. And you needed to be clothed in his righteousness. So, don't think... Don't be like Henry. Don't be like Henry. And let me introduce you to Henrietta now. Henrietta calls herself a Christian. She went forward at a meeting 30 years ago, and she felt quite emotional at the time. She signed a sinner's prayer card and had a nice talk with a counsellor who said that all she needed to do was to believe. She's not changed since. She needs to read the book of James. 
She's foul with her children. She gossips. She's a dreadful neighbor and never gives a penny to the poor. They ought to look after themselves. You see, she's not a Christian. Since faith without works, says James, is dead. You say, friends, real saving faith has works at its heart. And we must never forget that. I want to take us through the text now in James chapter 2. And we'll start off at verses 15 to 17. And what James basically does is he sets out two examples of what we'd call bogus faith. And two examples of real saving faith. And the first two examples, um, the first one of these two examples of bogus faith, I've called all mouth and no action equals a dead faith. I might um, be, be able to tell you about um, the game of golf, for example. I might be able to tell you, you know, which kind of clubs you should use on each hole. I might be able to tell you that um, if the wind's coming in a certain direction, you need to just shoot into the wind. But if I don't get out onto the golf course, it's all theoretical, isn't it? And, uh, and that's largely how I want it to stay with my golf, really. <laughs> but, but the point is... It's got to have legs. And so if we read 15 to 17, just for a moment. Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says, go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed. Well, it's not much use, is it? If they can't keep themselves well, can't feed themselves, and so on. And the truth is that too often as Christians, we keep our faith in our comfort zone. I will confine myself to words and limit myself in terms of action. And interestingly, as you read this text, the focus of the care that is being looked for is primarily with other Christians. It's not saying it's exclusive to that, but it's it's the emphasis. It says if you see a brother in need, do you notice? If you see a brother in need. And so the question I ask myself and I ask you if you're a follower of Jesus Christ and name him as your saviour and Lord, is how is it that your being around blesses your brother and your sister in Jesus Christ? What, what are the legs? How does it work out? So, you know, say you're at London School of Theology and you've got the assignment and it's got the book list and uh, you're wondering, how can I make my faith and my action stack together, would it look like Christian faith if you bombed down to the library, found every single book for that particular assignment, whisked them into your room, and, made sh- and then sort of quietly sort of <laughs> hope nobody noticed? I, I know, it's a temptation, isn't it? Sorry, it's a bit close, isn't it? Sorry about that, guys. Um, but it's difficult. Faith, getting our faith to work with action is difficult. You're really, really busy, totally stressed out. And you see your a brother at church who's looking a bit stressed themselves and you think, oh, goodness, I'm supposed to help them? Maybe, actually, if you were to reach out to them, you could help each other. Yeah. Faith without action is dead, says James. If you go on to verses 18 and 19, we see another example of bogus faith. And I've called this all mind and no action. But anyone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds and I will show you my faith by what I do. (laughs) You believe that there is one God. Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. Here, we're seeing somebody who's willing to have a nice intellectual argument with someone. Don't you just love it? And we'll pray for special safety for any of us and all of us who are doing theological education in this respect, because it is difficult to not become all mind and no action, particularly if you're aiming for a high grade. Um, You see, we can be intellectually orthodox and yet not have a saving faith if there isn't legs to it. Because real faith always has an outworking to it. You could say, I believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Has it done anything yet? 
The Bible says here in our text, the devil believes that too, but at least he shudders. Do you see what's being said? All mind and no action is no faith at all. You'll remember the story of Charles Blondin, um, I suspect, who walked across a tightrope across the Niagara Falls. Must have been a lovely view. And he went all the way across and then came all the way back and the crowd went wild. And he said out to the crowd, and he noticed one guy particularly enthusiastic, he said, do you believe I could go across there and back with a wheelbarrow? And the guy said, yes, we believe in you. Well, he didn't say that, but I just added that. <laughs> and he said, okay, hop into the wheelbarrow. <laughs> Faith without action is dead. We now come on to the sort of good example. And my kids always, well, in, in parenting, you're told to give the, the right examples, not the wrong ones, aren't you? You know, do this. And just look at the examples which James chooses. It's really shocking examples. Did you notice? Sacrifice your children and look after a prostitute. Well, no shock, no take, sharp intake of breath. Well, let's have a look at them in a bit more detail. Perhaps that was a bit brief. So verse 20, it says, You foolish man, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our ancestor Abraham considered righteous? And then he he surprises the reader. You see, anybody reading this would have expected him to say, Abraham um, believed in God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Do you remember the text? That was what they'd be expecting him to say. But he doesn't say that. He says, in verse 21 there, was not our ancestor considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son, his only son, on the altar? And if you don't know the story, he didn't go through with it, okay, if you were worried about that. But he was willing for his faith to impact his family life. He was willing for his faith to impact perhaps the most precious one that he had, his one and only son, the hope of the nations, the one through whom all the promises that God had made were expected to be fulfilled. He was willing to sacrifice that one because he wanted to obey the one he loved, Yahweh, the Lord God Almighty. You see, faith has action. Faith results in action which often is costly. I joked when Susie said, um, you know, would you like to help at Fridays? It might be fun. Well, it might be hard work. But wouldn't it be great if you did some hard work for the Lord? You, isn't that what we're called to? You know, didn't, Jesus didn't die and say, I died that you might have life in all its fullness. Certainly that's all true. And that we might give ourselves and walk in, in his path, the path that sometimes is a path of sacrifice and service. And the strange thing is, as we walk that path of sacrifice and service, we are blessed along the way. But if we stay in our comfortable places, doing exactly what we've already done, in our comfort zones, we won't see the blessing and others will not be saved because we won't be living out a saving faith. Do you follow me? So Abraham, what an example. He's the antidote to all mind and no action. He did what the Lord asked him to do. Verse 25, Rahab. In the same way, was not even Rahab, the prostitute, considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodgings to the spies and sent them off in a different direction? Such a contrast to all mouth and no action. Just imagine if she'd said to the spies that they'd come to her, they were looking to spy out the land and then to take it over. Um, if If she'd said to them, you know, do be careful that you don't get caught, you know, you, they could kill you. If she just said that, rather than saying, go up on the roof, hide up there, I'll, 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 I'll make sure they don't find you. She actually took action. She didn't just sort of tell them what would be a good idea. She actually took action to protect them. And have you ever thought what would have happened to Rahab if they'd found those spies on her roof? She was a traitor, wasn't she? Betraying her own country. What would they have done? Said, oh, you've been very naughty, Rahab. You really mustn't have spies to tea again. They'd have killed her, wouldn't they? 
This was costly, sacrificial response to her faith and belief that these were God's chosen ones. So Rahab and Abraham really do show us that faith, lively faith, has an outworking that will, at times, quite often, look sacrificial and costly. Today, we've offered gifts to the poor on the streets of Watford. This is not something nice to do. It's not something which makes harvest that bit more pleasant. It is the natural outworking of a lively faith in Jesus Christ. He didn't just say, take care. He healed the sick. He didn't just say, oh, do make sure you are well fed. He actually fed people. You see, real faith works. Get the kind of idea? I was, do you remember um, Steve Chalk used to have a, an organisation called Faith Works? I think it might have come from somewhere, you know, that title may have come from the, the epistle of, of James, you know, because faith works. Isn't it quite, do you like that? Write that down in your notes. <laughs> Yeah, faith works. Yeah, there we go. Um, anyway, and we've also made an offering, haven't we, to Tear Fund? And um, as I was, perhaps some of you haven't had as much time to think about this as I have, but as I was preparing for making that offering as part of my worship, I thought, well, what kind of an offering would be acceptable to God if my faith is a lively faith? Is it an offering that we won't even notice? Or is it an offering that will cost us something, that will be a sacrifice? I think you know the answer, don't you? May the offering that we have given this morning reveal living, lively faith. I'm excited when I see the finances of the church because I see in them signs of a lively faith. Yeah? But for many of us who were down at Latimer this last week, I was challenged, deeply challenged, by how much I do in terms of time and money for the poor, and that's difficult for us in this area. I know there are poor in this area, but it's hard, there's harder to find the poor in this area than in most parts of the world. But there are many, many poor people around. It's harvest. God has blessed you and me. And he says that all of this, everything, belongs to him. We are just looking after it for a little while. If we truly believe this, then the outworking of this is sharing with others. May the mustard seed of faith prove full of life and bless others and feed others and bring many to love Jesus. And ultimately may this faith well up in each one of us when it's full grown to eternal life. The produce and gifts here show a sign of our lively faith. The offering in these bags are not separate to our faith. They show that your faith is real. And this faith does not disappoint us. So we pray. I pray for myself and my brothers and sisters here that this word would take, take root in our lives. I pray that many, many people will be able to give thanks because of the faith found in Cheney's Baptist Church. Thank you for every sign of lively faith in this place. Faith that has legs. Faith that works. And Lord, may we not just try to add works to faith, but may we seek you, the one who gives us the gift of faith. That faith that has within it works. May we not be people who just seek to please you for our salvation, for our salvation is absolutely secure, but simply out of that assurance out of our gratitude, out of our love for you, Jesus, may we sacrificially lay down our lives for the glory of your name, for the coming of your kingdom. This we pray. Amen.